today on Beyond Six Seconds. When you think too much about the stereotypes and the labels and this and that, it can take away your chance to actually be there for a person. And while it's so important to understand mental health, you should focus more on understanding what an individual needs because that varies heavily. Welcome to Beyond Six Seconds, the podcast that goes beyond the six second first impression to share the extraordinary stories and achievements of everyday people. I'm your host, Carolyn Keel. On today's episode, I'm speaking with Charlotte Underwood. Charlotte is a mental health advocate and a writer with a passion for preventing suicide and providing support for those in need. Charlotte, welcome to the podcast. Hi, thanks for having me. Wonderful to have you here. So tell me, what inspired you to start writing about mental health? I think I've always been interested in writing. Since I was a toddler, I've always enjoyed coming up with stories. But I found like as I've grown older, I've lost a lot of my imagination. So I struggled to write about things that I was proud of. And then I just thought about the things that really mattered to me. And mental health was the one thing that stood out and it just seemed to fit so perfectly. I see. Is that a topic that's really close to you personally so that you can draw from your own experiences and your writing? Yeah, I mean, I've dealt with mental health issues myself for as long as I can remember. But I also lost my dad to suicide. So it's very, very personal. I see. I'm sorry to hear that. Are those the types of experiences that you draw on for the writing that you do? I usually talk about anything and everything that I can speak about from a personal experience. I never like to assume a story. Mm -hmm. So I draw on what I've been through and If I have, then I'll write about it. Mm -hmm. And you currently have your own blog and you do freelance writing as well. Is all of that focused around mental health and uh, drawing from the personal experiences that you've had? Or what other types of writing do you do in that area? Majority of it does all tie in with mental health or mental health and relationships at a stretch. But I also do some things on pets as well. So (laughs) I dabble. (laughs) (laughs) Good stuff. So you're drawing from your own personal experiences when writing about mental health and sharing your own stories about that. What's it like sharing your personal experiences so openly with the world through your writing? It's terrifying, but liberating at the same time. Mm -hmm. There's definitely that fear that it can affect my future chances at employment or be judged by people before I even got to know them properly. But at the other side, it makes you realize how I shouldn't have to be worried about it. And that gives me more reason to talk about it, to normalize it. Mm -hmm. Um, So the negative only fuels my motivation. I see. We're talking, we're actually in different countries right now. So I'm in the United States and I'm at least somewhat aware that mental health is certainly a a difficult issue for people to talk about in this country. I believe we're getting more and more open about it, but still there are so many challenges and still unfortunately a stigma in the United States a lot of times with sharing it. As you described, people are concerned about it, having an impact on how people view them. And you're calling from the United Kingdom. What is the atmosphere like there around mental health? I feel that we have a lot of charities who help get people to talk about their mental health. But if you go to any employer, going to school, going to a doctor, you notice there's still a lot of stigma. And it's usually these professionals that leave you not wanting to talk about it. So... It's heavily stigmatized, but I don't think it's from my generation or the generations below. I think it's something that's more deep set in older generations who have only been raised that way. So it's not making them bad. It's just what they know. And if they've been taught that mental health isn't real and it's all these things, then it makes sense as to why that's what they believe, if that makes sense. Yeah, I'm very interested in that because you're talking about feeling that stigma and that prejudgment from medical professionals and and others. Can you talk more about that? Oh, definitely. There are a few people that I've spoken to who do find themselves having 
wonderful mental health care with wonderful doctors and nurses and professionals. However, when I've gone for myself, when my dad was trying to get help, when I've spoken to other people in my area and all over the UK, it seems that there's more of a majority of people who are getting doctors that are focusing on their personal opinions more than what's right for the patient. Mm -hmm. So they're letting their beliefs, I guess, affect the health of patients. And it's, it's really dangerous. And I believe you've written about this on your blog and in your freelance writing recently. You know, it sounds like from what you said that they may not really believe in mental health issues or they just don't feel like it's a concern. Or is it more like if you've had mental health challenges in the past that they tend to think that physical illness is a just a manifestation of mental illness? I think it's all of that. I had a doctor recently and I would tell them some pretty personal physical issues that I had. And they were like, oh, it's just anxiety. That's all it is. They didn't even try to look into it. I um, didn't even do a basic test. And uh, it took me a year of agony mm. <laughs> and physical discomfort before someone actually looked at me and was like, oh, yeah, here you go. And after a year of being in pain, I had two months of treatment and I was okay. Wow. And that was an excess of just because the doctor believed that it was on my anxiety that I didn't get taken seriously and that it wasn't dangerous for me in the situation. It did leave me to be in pain for a long time. And it's concerning because there are patients out there who maybe have more serious illnesses and if they're not getting taken seriously, that can be potentially life-threatening and it's disturbing. But I think it depends on the doctor that you have and... It really shouldn't be that way because I think all doctors should be trained in mental health and all doctors should treat a patient as they would a patient without mental health issues. Absolutely. Yeah, that really is disturbing. And even the statement alone that, oh, it's just anxiety as if that's, I don't know, what does that do? (laughs) That doesn't help either. (laughs) So, wow. Yeah, that's challenging and really, really concerning. So, I mean, along with your writing, you also do um, advocacy for mental health. And how did that come about? Because I guess it's one thing to write about and share your own personal experiences, but how did you become active in advocacy for mental health? Oh, I do a bit of volunteering for my local charity Mind, who focus on mental health and provide a range of services. But I also did a charity ball where it was focused all about suicide and I raised money for charity, but I also had people talking about suicide and how it's affected them as someone who's lost someone to suicide, someone who's been suicidal and someone who's watched people they love struggle with suicidal thoughts. So that was in my community and I've occasionally had the chance to speak about these issues on the media as well when I've been invited. So it's just, it all ties in with each other with just raising my voice about it, really. Oh, that's great. And really continuing that conversation for people about mental health and suicide prevention. And I think really having more people talk about it openly helps alleviate some of the stigma because people you know, even now tend to um, have it be something that's not talked about for a variety of reasons. So I think that's really powerful to share your story that way. For sure. What would you say are the biggest challenges you've faced in either writing about or advocating for mental health? Getting people to pay attention. Mm -hmm. I've noticed that while there are plenty of people who appreciate your support, there's plenty of people who don't want to listen. And when I've tried to campaign and talk about things in the past, there are a lot of people out there who will outright ignore you or just be like, yeah, I'm not interested. And they don't give you, they don't give mental health a chance to be spoken about. That's always been the biggest issue and more reason as to why I do what I do. Wow. I kind of wonder what's behind that, if it's the the stigma or just people being uncomfortable with it or people not feeling like it's something that should be discussed? I don't know. Do you have a sense of where the resistance comes from? I think it's a mixture of all of it. I think if someone was passionate 
about mental health, they wouldn't let the stigma stop them. And I think obviously people always worry about their reputation and maybe it's that. Maybe if they get involved in it, they're worried about what people will say about them. But it's definitely a mixture of things because there are plenty of angles that people can attack you if you talk about mental health. And I think that concerns people a lot. Yeah, I guess people worry about being open to to being judged, as you were saying before, and and what that'll look like. Wow. What would be kind of the main things that you'd want people to know about mental illness? If there's sort of a couple of messages that you wanted to get across to people who were having a hard time listening. I suppose it's just stop treating it like a disease, stop treating it like an illness and focus more on listening to people. When you think too much about the stereotypes and the labels and this and that, it can take away your chance to actually be there for a person. And while it's so important to understand mental health, you should focus more on understanding what an individual needs because that varies heavily. (laughs) Yeah, it really goes back to listening and, and really hearing people. And as you said, it's not a one dimensional issue or concern. Mental illness is almost, it sounds as varied as the people who are challenged with it. So I think listening is important. And I think a lot of times other people just don't know how to listen in that case. Do you have any advice for people who may think that a friend or a loved one is struggling with mental illness, but they're not sure like how to help or what to say? Do you have any advice for how they can help their friends and loved ones with that? Make the effort to check on them every day or every other day. Make sure they know that you're there for them. Encourage them to spend time with you. And if they can't go outside, do something inside or in their home. Take them out for a coffee. Try to remind them of the things that make them feel good rather than just assume that they want to be left alone because a lot of the times they're waiting for someone to come in and help them, but they don't have the confidence to say or ask. Yeah, definitely. And it sounds like it's about individualizing that concern, knowing your friend or loved one, knowing what's important to them and just being there for them. And maybe it's not as much as saying the right words, but it's being there to listen and and support them and do the things that you remember that they enjoyed. And above all, not just ignoring them and leaving them alone because you're too afraid to say the wrong thing or not know what to do. Yeah, I think a lot of people are so quick to jump to assumptions or they're very quick to rearrange their priorities so they're too busy to see their friends or make a phone call. And I think when you start treating people as important as you feel they are, Mm -hmm. it can make a difference to their mental health because you can say you love someone all you want, but they're not going to believe you unless you show it. And we know that's true in like romantic relationships, but it's true in platonic relationships as well. Absolutely. I feel like in society today, that's something that we struggle with across the board. And I think as we get older and go through different stages of life, you know, I, I feel like in some ways it's it's easier to make friends and have those natural bonds when when you're younger and you're in school and then you're in college or university. And then after that, when you're in the world, it's I feel like as a well, this is more my experience, I guess. But as a young adult or in middle age, it's harder. It's really hard to to keep those bonds, to keep up those friendships. It takes effort. It takes time and prioritization. And as you said, it's really easy to to fall into that trap of saying, I'm too busy. You know, I don't have time to make time for this because I've got, you know, all these other things going on. And I think what you said is a really important reminder that our friendships are very important, regardless of what's going on in our lives. And our true friends really deserve our time and attention. And it's something that we all need to pay attention to, especially if we know or suspect that our friends might be struggling. Definitely. Yeah. So you've really been very open about sharing your experiences um, in your writing, both freelance and on your blog. And um, I know you have a lot of readers and, and people who follow and are touched by your writing. Are there any 
memorable responses or pieces of feedback that you've gotten from a reader or two that you'd like to share that was really memorable for you? The first writing that I did was a short book on my prospect for my father's suicide. And it was really to raise awareness about what it's like to both be suicidal and watch someone disappear and also how that affects you when they're gone. And I had a message a while later and they said, I was told to read it and because of that book, my wife still has a husband and my son still have a dad. And I got very emotional because that was the whole purpose. And I wish that my dad would have been able to have that same bit of support that he did. So that's the one that really sticks with me through everything. Wow. That's so powerful and amazing that, you know, by sharing your story, you you really got to see the the direct impact that you had on saving someone's life. That's incredible. And it's just so important that, again, we really need to talk about these issues openly and honestly. And um, yeah, that's that's really amazing. Wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. Looking forward, what kind of goals would you still like to accomplish with your writing? I think I just want to keep at it. And it sounds silly, but as much as it'd be nice to have loads of recognition and have awards and all that stuff, I more want to know that I'm going to be as passionate about it now as I am in a year. And my only goal is to make sure that I don't give up on it because I'll be starting university and that'll be three years. So my goal is to not lose my love of writing or my advocacy, no matter what happens in life, basically. That's a really really wonderful goal. And that consistency and staying with it is so important. And there's just so much more to share on that topic. That's really, really great. Wow. So how can people get in touch with you and where can they learn more about your writing? Well, they can find all of my work on my website, which is charlotteunderwoodauthor.com. If they want to keep more up to date with me, Twitter's their best bet which is at C Underwood UK. Hey, thank you. And I'll put that in the show notes so that people can see those links as well and have easy access to those. Charlotte, thank you so much for being on my show and, and sharing the amazing writing and advocacy around mental health and suicide prevention that you've been doing. It's really incredible to see the impact that you're having on people and I really wish you the continued best of luck and and support with all of your writing. I think it's really, really important and you're having a really wonderful impact. As we close out the show, is there anything else that you'd like our listeners to know or anything that my listeners can either help or support you with? I think as long as they're reminded that there is absolutely no shame in having mental illness and there's absolutely no shame in talking about it, then that's all I'd want them to know. (laughs) That's all that matters at the end of the day. Great words to live by. Thank you again, Charlotte. I really appreciate you sharing your story today. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Beyond Six Seconds. Please help us spread the word about this podcast. Share it with a friend, give us a shout out on your social media, or write a review on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast player. You can find all of our episodes on our website, www.beyond6seconds.com. Until next time.